Welcome to another edition of Inside Medicine. I'm your host, Doug Geinzer, and we are here in the studio today with retired Colonel Charles Hodges, the Senior Director of Events and Programs of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, which oversees our hires, our hiring our heroes corporate fellowship program. For those of you that are new to Inside Medicine, we broadcast right here in the studio every Thursday, bringing to you those that are involved in the healthcare industry in Las Vegas, movers and shakers, doing innovative things, medical education. And today we're going to talk about what it takes to bring our retiring and exiting military folks into the healthcare industry through amazing programs like what the uh, Hiring Our Heroes does. Welcome to the studio, Charles. Yeah, thanks. Great to be here. Should I call you Charles? Should I call you Colonel? You can call me Chuck, Charles, or call me anything you want. Just don't call me late for dinner. So. There you I like that. I like that. Well, first and foremost, thank you for your service. You're retired from the U.S. Army. Yep. Uh, how many years did you spend in there? Uh, I spent 27 years on active duty, and then mm-hmm. I was a young enlisted guy for three years in the uh, Florida National Guard, so I got 30 years of total service. Well, thank you for your service. Much appreciated for that. So, we're going to jump in. We really want to learn a little bit about the corporate uh, fellowship program. Uh, Meredith Leary has been bringing that into the Las Vegas marketplace, and Las Vegas Heels is, really wants to support this every way that we can. I'm a prior service guy myself, and I uh, there's nothing that uh, that makes me happier than helping our servicemen enter the workplace. There's some challenges that are out there. We want to make sure that we overcome those challenges, and uh, they make some of the finest employees. It's they highly disciplined. They show up on time. They've got a great work ethic, and a lot of that doesn't exist here in the Las Vegas marketplace. And uh, I think that's going to change some things around. You can take my job right there. So you, you said it all for me right there. there. <laughs> so tell us, uh, give us a high level view of the program. Then we're going to dive into some details. I want to learn a little bit more about your background and and kind of how you got involved in this program because you you've developed this thing for some time. Yeah. So the, the program started uh, it's almost five years ago now. So you know back in 2012, uh, the, the Congress came up with this thing called the VAL Act, the Veterans Opportunity to Work Act, and mm-hmm. basically said. Said, hey, DOD, uh, you need to do a better job of transitioning folks out of the military. Uh, as part of that law, they had a thing called the Skill Bridge Authority, which basically says uh, on your last 180 days when you're on active duty, you can go off and pursue training, fellowships, internships. They're going to prepare you for employment. Uh, so when I was the base commander out at Joint Base Lewis McCord in Washington State, I was very aware of the law because our senator, Senator Patty Murray, is the one who wrote the law, uh, so knew the inside track on that. So when the law got passed, we started looking at opportunities, what they call career skills programs. So take advantage of that law and allow folks to go off and do uh, training events and internships. And when we first started off, we were working on mostly young enlisted guys on things like uh, veterans and piping and welding and electricians and IT uh, consultants and that kind of thing. But what we didn't have was a program designed primarily for mid-level management, junior officers, NCOs. What were we doing for those folks? Uh, And when I asked my staff about it, they said, we're doing nothing for them. Uh, So I said, all right, let's try this out. We know what the law says. Uh, Let's uh, grab a bunch of service members. Let's go up to Seattle and talk to Amazon and Microsoft and Starbucks and say, we'll give you a service member for for 12 weeks. They're going to work for you. At the time, it was three days a week, Monday through Wednesday. Uh, The only thing you have to do to participate is have a job opening you're trying to fill. Uh, And we said, let's beta test it. And my guy said, no, you're crazy. This is never going to work. I said, hey, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. But let's give it a shot. Uh, So we tried our first one, uh, ran it through. Uh, 12 weeks later, we were at graduation down at the uh, the Capitol there in Olympia, Washington, uh, and I wasn't sure whether we were a success or not. And then the guy from Amazon pulled me aside and said, hey, can I talk to you about the program? And frankly, I was worried. He was going to tell me, hey, this was terrible. We can't do this again. And he said, hey, man, I, I love this. And I go, okay, well, great. So what's the problem? He said, well, the only problem is I don't want to share these guys with anybody else. Uh, <laughs> That's so a great we, compliment. <laughs> oh, yeah, without a doubt. So I, you know, I saw that. I knew that we had a winner there. Uh, and the program sort of expanded from there on Joint Base Lewis McCord. But when I retired and took this job is when we said, hey, let's see what we can do. We buy that franchise and expand it nationally. And that's where we are now at 10 different locations all across the country. That's cool. So is it available to all servicemen? Is it available to all branches? Yeah. So right now, all branches, all services that are out there, uh, the prerequisite for to, to be part of the program is you have to have a AA degree or a bachelor's degree. If you have an AA degree, you have to have five years experience. If you have a bachelor's degree, you need to have three years experience. And so those are the two prerequisites from a military experience perspective. And then you have to have the recommendation from your military leadership that are going to sign off because they do allow you to do this while you're still on active duty. So the the DOD is still paying you while you participate. So you have to have their approval. So I understand a lot of the acronyms. Our audience may not. So DOD, Department of Defense. Yeah, my bad. bad. (laughs) I thought I I, I civilianized somewhat, but once in a while I do fall back into the acronym mode. Yes, Department, Department of Defense. And so the Department of Defense will pay these folks to go through this fellowship 
scholarship program. Is there a, a responsibility on corporate America? Do they have to pay as well? No. So the, the only two requirements for companies to participate are, one, you have to have a job opening you're looking to fill. Mm-hmm. So this is not a chance to, hey, I want to wave the flag and do this. You have to have an actual job you're looking to fill with the candidates. So that's number one. And the second thing is you have to have an actual have a training plan that you're going to do. So the mm-hmm. 12 weeks there with you, you have to let, demonstrate, hey, here's what they're going to do while they're here. Now, every company is different. Some companies say, hey, you're going to spend all 12 weeks in the finance department. Yeah. Some companies say, like the Amazons or the Starbucks that have multiple opportunities, they'll say, hey, you're going to spend a week with finance, a week with supply mm-hmm. chain, a week with HR, and then whichever one, which your hiring manager likes yeah. you the most, you're going to go with them. That's awesome. So, from a serviceman perspective, what type of skills are they typically bringing into corporate America? You know, it's is there uh, in particular are, are they all IT guys? Or are they all personnel guys? Or is it across the board? Yeah, it's it's really across the board. So you have you can have an infantry guy, you could have a pilot. We've got a actual Thunderbird pilot participating. Uh, in the program. So you've got IT, you name it, you've, you cross the entire spectrum of military occupational specialties. You have folks participating as well as rank structure. So we have as, you know, as junior as an E3, yeah. all the way up to 06 as full colonels yeah. uh, that have participated in the program. If you had to identify the corporate partner that has achieved the highest level of success, what was that and what was their secret magic behind? Yeah, I mean, I, I think a lot, all of them had success because yeah. all of them come to us going, wow, you know, can you get more of those? I was, I was shocked at all. The company that we've had the most success with who's hired the most fellows is Amazon. Yeah. Uh, and not because they're a great company, uh, but they have a national reach. I mean, and their demand is so high because they're growing and, you know, taking over the world one small city at a time. Yeah. Uh, but they have so many opportunities. They've been our, our biggest employer. But we've had Hilton Hotels and we've got Capital One and we've got Prudential and United Parcel Service, uh, Lockheed Martin. You can go down the list, uh, Hospital Corporation of America, you can go down the list of companies inside the United States that participated. Up to date, we've got 178 different companies that have hosted a, a fellow uh, at their at their company. That's awesome. So, can small and mid-sized businesses do oh, yeah. that as well? Yeah, without a doubt. So we we don't. The only our requirement is our salary ranges we're looking at. So yeah. based on the experience these folks have, uh, our average salary for this year, 2017, was eighty six thousand dollars a year okay. uh, for the graduates coming out of there. We maintain saying if you're going to participate, uh, you have to have a minimum of fifty thousand dollar a year job offer that you're looking to fill. That's often driven by geography. So if you're in South Texas, the cost of living and the salary range is going to be different than if you're doing a fellowship in New York City or Seattle. So yeah. it's sort of driven by uh, geography more than it is by the actual job. So how did this program get attached to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce? Yeah, well, the Chamber uh, of Hiring Our Heroes itself was established, you know, back in 2011. Uh, They said, hey, we are the connection for business. What are we doing to help solve this veteran unemployment problem? And so Hiring Our Heroes was started initially to do that, just, hey, do a hiring events, connect businesses with service members that have transitioned or are transitioning, and we've evolved since then. So the fellowship program, uh, when we first started it up, they were sort of a co-sponsor with us all and said, hey, we love that idea because we're looking at different models uh, to actually help out the transitioning service member and military spouses, I should say, because it's not just service members, but it's military spouses as well. And so that's sort of how they got attached to it. And then when I came in, I said, I, I know the success is pretty exciting. Uh, I know the results. Let's look at expansion and how can we take this from just the the two locations at the time, Seattle and Fort Hood, Texas, to where we are now, which is uh, New Jersey, New York, Atlanta, Kentucky, all over Texas, Colorado. So truly California, full national reach. So what? why Vegas? You know, obviously we've got Nellis Air Force Base here, which I, I will say is one of the finest assets that Las Vegas has, but Las Vegas corporate Entities have not really understood the value of that. Right. And that's some of what we want to help you all with your success here is how do we let the employers realize that we've got this huge base that's here, a lot of exiting servicemen. How do we embrace them? They're bringing great skills in. How do we keep them in the Valley? And then on top of that, from our perspective, we're in healthcare. So I want to learn a little bit about how healthcare could work closer with you. But sure. you know, what attracted the program to Las Vegas? Ve- frankly, it was Nellis contacting us. Uh, really? So okay. Meredy Leary, who actually, she was my program program manager who ran this thing, ran it nationally, just happens to live here in Las Vegas. Uh, so she was talking to Nellis. So what we've seen is the program has grown and expanded that bases start contacting us because they've heard from other bases as well as they've heard from service members that say, hey, my buddy at Joint Base Lewis McCord was participating in this program. 
do we have that here? Yeah. Uh, and so in this particular case, it was us being here physically, Meredith being here physically located here, and then Nellis going, hey, can you can you come talk to us about this fellowship program yeah. and get it launched up? And we're always like, sure. And that's you know our biggest the biggest thing we need is a companies, great companies yep. like you have here in Las Vegas that are willing to participate, and then you have to have the base leadership and the service members that are that are in as well. If you have those two 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 ingredients together, you can come up with some pretty pretty amazing things. Yeah, I went to an event. I think it was about three weeks ago, and it was uh, hosted. I, I Obviously, Meredith put it together, but uh, Colonel Steve Soroka, Councilman Steve mm-hmm. Soroka, uh, really, he, he came out of Nellis Air Force Base. Uh, again, an amazing asset that was out there. Stayed in the Valley. He helped grow our Las Vegas Metro Chamber of Commerce. Now he's on our city council. Uh, he gets it. Yeah. Uh, brought a lot of folks together. And man, this room was packed with employers. And to just watch the servicemen get up there and the excitement, the enthusiasm that they had, I just sat there. I'm, I, I wish we had more jobs personally at Las Vegas Heels. We just don't. Right. But I did make a commitment to Meridi. How do we bring this program? How do we get it introduced into healthcare? And I want to put you on the spot and, and, yeah. and ask, how do you see that happening where we both benefit? Yeah, I mean, I think from a company perspective, I mean, companies normally when they hear about this program, their first response is, right. You know, how, how can this how can this be you're gonna i'm gonna have a fellow for 12 weeks that's gonna work for work for me for free while it'll be paid by the dod there's got to be something illegal uh, and we say no it's not it's part of the fair labor standards act we work with the department of labor so it's all free lawyers are our biggest uh our impediment to progress are but, they always yes <laughs> they are. but i mean rightfully so because they're trying to protect the company and make sure they're not in liability but we always say hey it's I can send you a dozen companies that have already figured that out. Uh, so let's get through that piece. So that's one is the legal piece. Number two is, from a company's perspective, is the hiring managers and making sure they have an understanding of, A, not only the position that's available, uh, but what the service members are bringing. Because I think too many times uh, companies think, okay, uh, I'm going to get a young guy, 21 years old, uh, limited skills coming out of the military, which you and I both know is just about as far from the truth as possible. Yep. Uh, so it's you know getting those hiring managers to understanding what the assets are. And, and that's when our process is doing that through the interview process and the one-on-ones and the type of networking receptions you describe to understanding that. So to the other point is how do you get companies more involved? That's what we're hoping we're doing today is. Yeah. Hey, companies out there, if you're, you're listening right now or watching right now, understand that this program exists. Uh, and I always tell them, it's, it's free chicken for you, okay? It doesn't cost you a thing to participate. Uh, there's no investment on you on the front end uh, doing all. So it's really no risk f- from you. And I said, you hire people all the time. You interview them. They sit down in panels. You bring them on board. And sometimes they work out and sometimes they don't. In this particular case, you're going to do the exact same thing. You're going to interview them. You're going to understand who they are. You're going to bring them on. The difference is you're on a test drive period. You're test driving them for 12 weeks. At the end of that 12 weeks, if they don't work out, Okay, great. And then they'll move on from something else. But on the the upside is they do work out. And now you've got a great employee that you test drove for 12 weeks and you know what they're going to bring to the table. And our success rate is pretty darn high. So I just did our numbers for 2017. Uh, We're at 81% uh, placement rate for the fellows that go through or offer rates coming out of there with the average salary again of $86,000 a year. So companies are every single time. I've never had a company yet to come back and says, oh, that was terrible. We'll never do that again. It's always hey, how can I expand this? Or yeah. how can I take this to another location in the country where we are? Or how can I get more of these folks? So it's never a, I've never once had a negative experience from a company. Yeah. It's always, hey, we want more and get involved. So I would say from a Las Vegas perspective, if you're a company out there and you have a position that's mid-level management that you want to bring in or a professional position with a salary range, then take a look at the fellowship program. Yeah. And I, I'm pretty sure you'll you come up and you'll be very happy about it. Yeah. So Las Vegas Heels, we're a healthcare related group. Mm-hmm. Heels is an acronym for Health, Education, Advocacy, and Leadership of Southern Nevada. Our membership makes up the largest uh, healthcare employers in the Valley. We represent groups that employ a little over 34,000 healthcare professionals. Uh, an interesting report that came out of the DOL, Department of mm-hmm. Labor, uh, was that healthcare is now the largest job creator and in industry in the United States. Right. So it has to be appealing for military. And... Healthcare, it's an industry, so it's not just healthcare providers. We need folks on finance, on IT, on security, every single area. So how does that integrate with military? Because obviously right. all those skills are transferable. Yeah, well, you said it exactly right. I mean, I think uh, so many times people think, you say healthcare, and automatically you think nurses, nurse practitioners, doctors, PAs, whatever it may be. But it is a much more, it's across the board. Healthcare needs IT professionals. Healthcare needs HR. So the service members you're going to get coming in are going to have that broad range of experiences. You're going to have some who are medical 
technical mm-hmm. medical folks that would be a natural fit. Those are, you know, they're diamonds out there. Everybody wants those individuals. Yeah. Very slimmer at Hal. If you're, if you're a cyber, if you're a cyber guy, everybody wants a cyber person. Uh, so from a healthcare perspective, it's looking more broadly at their experiences. Yeah. The one downside that I think companies do is they look and say, hey, they must have three to five years corporate experience in the healthcare industry. Yeah. Well, when you do that, you've self-selected all those fellows out of the program because they're not going to consider them themselves three to five years corporate experience. Even yeah. though the DOD, the Department of Defense, the military is a large corporation, they say, well, they don't want me. They want someone who's worked for a hospital or whatever it may yeah. be. Uh, so it's thinking more broadly about the skill sets that the individuals come in and understanding that's what, you know, they'd be a great fit. And I tell from the service member's perspective all the time, don't judge a company or organization by their brand. So I would say, you see Starbucks, well, you know, World Association, Starbucks, coffee, okay? Starbucks has baristas, yes, but 99% of their employees aren't baristas. They're doing everything else out there, yep. and healthcare is the exact same way. I say, especially our healthcare professionals, all what amazes me, the guys who are in healthcare in the military, and I say, what do you want to do when you get out? Anything but healthcare. You know, I'm like, what, really? <laughs> What's going on with that? No, I want to go into IT or I want to go in HR. And so that's fantastic. But too many companies, you know, will say, well, I want the healthcare person or the service member yeah. will say, I don't want to work in healthcare, not realizing, again, there's, you know, multiple opportunities under that umbrella. Yeah. So it was great. To, you know, Meredith is an asset to your organization. Rock, she's, rock star. Yeah, she's amazing. Uh, she was brought to us by Jim Anders, who chairs our Workforce Council. Mm-hmm. And Jim and I and, and Meredith got together earlier this week. We said, how do we develop this program a little bit. And one of the things we talked about was almost creating a, um, almost a reverse job board to take the servicemen, put their skills up there so our HR folks can look at it Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe give some preference to hiring habits of servicemen because there's a benefit. Again, they come with the skills necessary, but on top of that, it's free labor for 12 weeks. Mm -hmm. You know, let's, let's let's look at it that way. That's, that's appealing. Correct. Um, Very, very good. Talk to us. You created this program. And it wasn't just through the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. You brought it over there. Right. What sparked the idea to develop this program? It was, it was basically a need. Uh, so at the time, we had great programs for our young enlisted guys getting out. I mean, amazing. From you know Microsoft to plumbing to electrician, you name it, all these amazing programs. But it was a time where we were actually putting out, uh, kicking out, uh, a lot of young captains uh, and sergeant first class or, or sergeant first class in the military were leaving. I said, well, what do we have for those guys in place? Because their skill set and their experience is far different than the young enlisted guy. And they said, uh, we've got nothing. Yeah. I said, OK, well, we've got to try to create something. So that was the uh, impetus for creating was a, a basically demand from the military going, these guys are getting out. Uh, and what are we going to be able to do to help them out there? So that's sort of st- the spark that started the entire program uh, was that. Yep. So how does this program differ from a college internship? You know, a lot of our employers are used to those. Mm-hmm. Uh, and some of them go, well, gosh, I've got to take this person that's wet behind the ears, bring them in. Yeah, it's free, but I've got to pay somebody to, tr- to train them. There are some differentiators here, and I'm sure you could help. Oh, yeah. Those. I mean, so you know, a college internship, you're a 21-year-old with no experience, you know, maybe work in a restaurant or wherever it is, and you've got a college degree. This is not who is participating in the fellowship. All these individuals have three to five years military experience and leadership experience. So that's the big thing coming to the table is you give them a project. They're all about, hey, got it. I've been doing this my entire military career. Don't tell me how to suck the egg. Just tell me what you need or I'll do after there. So give them the project and they'll run with it. Uh, and the company, so I'll say, for instance, Starbucks, that's what they've done for their fellows. So they always give their fellows a project that they're working on. Uh, that's a challenge. They have the 12 weeks to do it, and then they present to senior VPs once they're completed, uh, and that's how they run. So from a company's perspective, you're not getting a college intern. You're getting a seasoned professional uh, that comes with a, a broad range of experiences, and from a leadership perspective, a great, great amount of experience than they're going to have in the civilian sector. So, you know, you get a sergeant first class or you get a master sergeant. Okay, they've been the number two guy or leading 150 to 300 folks that are out there. You get a captain, 175 guys out there. So they've got a lot, a lot of leadership experience. And when you tell them, okay, you're going to have three direct reports, well, that's it. Three, three. Okay, I got it. So yeah. that's the thing. I, it's the difference is understanding that this is not a brand new, wet behind the ears college graduate this is someone that comes with a a depth and breadth of experience that you're going to have our time finding elsewhere so getting back to healthcare, and i'm going to ask some very selfish and uh some questions so las vegas we uh we have shortages Mm -hmm. across every single area from doctors to nurses to pts to ot's you name it we have shortages we're looking for those clinical skill sets those folks that are exiting the military do they possess those 
how do we build a pipeline right. to benefit? How do we develop a program to say, if you're exiting and you've got clinical experience, Vegas is here with open arms. For example, we passed uh, a bill in the legislature in 2015, an expedited licensure bill to be able to take an exiting military person and get them licensed in the state of Nevada, I believe it's in under 45 days. Mm -hmm. How can we align with you? Where are those bases that we could form partnerships with and how do we go about doing that? Yeah, so the beauty part of the program now is, and I I didn't mention this up to this point is, uh, part of it is then called, I'm using an acronym and then I'll explain Mm -hmm. it, permissive TDY, which means permissive temporary duty. Meaning I'm a service member, say I'm assigned to uh, Fort Campbell, Kentucky. Mm -hmm. I wanna live in Las Vegas. I can come to Las Vegas to participate in that fellowship. So from our perspective, we have national reach at 10 different locations and all the bases. If I have a fellow with with, with medical experience and we understand the demand signals here in, in Las Vegas, hey, you've got medical experience, or you want to relocate to Las Vegas, is that something you want to do? So you're not looking at just Nellis Air Force Base as a part of the, the talent pool because it's a limited number of folks there who may have medical experience, you can look more broadly from a national perspective. So we could tap other bases. What about, about, well, not only the bases, international. So we've got fellows, uh, we launched our Atlanta program here next week. Uh, We've got a fellow from Okinawa uh, on there. And actually we had our first fellow, no one believes this, but we had, they called me up and said, uh, we've got a a fellow from Timbuktu. And I said, you've got to be kidding me. (laughs) And they showed me the application. It was actually a Marine communications guy who assigned to Nepal and he's actually lives in Timbuktu. So we, oh have, we have fellows all over the, we have fellows all over the United States, including Timbuktu. So, well, interesting. You brought up Fort Campbell, Kentucky. I went to basic training there. A lot of people roll their eyes. <laughs> they go, they don't have basic training, but this was back in 88 with the mobile army training center Probably where are. we went to the map station. They kind of pulled out of the hat, a base, and then they yeah. activated everybody. And I ended up in Fort Campbell, 102 <laughs> degrees, full humidity. It was a wonderful summer. Yes. <laughs> <Gotta love it>. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to touch on another area that you guys are, are really focusing on. And that's the idea of the trailing spouse Mm -hmm. of a serviceman. Tell us a little bit about that program. It probably differs a little bit, uh, but how can we align with you on that? Well, so, you know, military spouses are a huge component. So we've, you know, pretty much the veteran employment rate, 2.9% below the national average. We're really getting after that. Uh, But what's still sort of national tragedy is the spouse unemployment rate, uh, which is above 16% right now nationally. Uh, The number one reason why service members get out of the uniform is because of the demand signals from their spouse saying, I can't have a second career uh, while you're on active duty. So uh, we've taken that on as a challenge, uh, working with uh, Dr. Joe Biden and the current administration going, hey, how can we help solve this problem of the military spouse piece? So what we've done at certain locations, uh, Fort Hood, Texas, Joint Base Lewis McCord, and out in Washington, D.C., is we've worked with the Department of Labor on workforce grants uh, under the Dislocated Worker Program that allows spouses to participate in the program. Uh, because currently, if you're an active duty military, the DOD, the Department of Defense, is still paying your salary while you participate. If you're a spouse, that's not the case. So how do we allow them to participate? The grants pay them a stipend while they go through the, through the program. And so while that's not at all our locations nationally, it's only at those locations where the local workforce boards have applied for those DL, uh, Department of Labor grants, they were able to pull that off. So, so does that run through like those we, the old WIA funds, the Workforce Investment Act type funds? Exactly okay. right, going through the grants out there. And it's yeah. actually under the Dislocated Worker Program because sure. military spouses are, are, are given that uh, criteria because they are based on having to move and PCS around or move, basically get assigned to different locations uh, that they're dislocated workers. That's good. Uh, that's something that we should look at leveraging as well. Yeah, I always tell, you know, if you're the workforce boards, you know, apply for those grants and then we yeah. can help, you know, help you out in, in the process for those because it's a, it's a great opportunity. With the military spouses, yeah. I always tell, I know for my household, my wife will tell me all the time, the military spouses are a far more talented population than the active duty service <laughs> members are. So. Of course. <laughs> so we, we covered a lot here. Yeah. Is there anything that we have not covered that you feel would be relevant to our audience? Uh, Yeah, I think from a company's perspective is if you're out there, you know, take a shot at it. Uh, And you may hear, like most companies are, they're always very skeptical about the whole thing. And and I understand that. I mean, and and we do our best to try to alleviate some of that skepticism and some of the concerns. And and my folks will walk them through that process. But take a chance. And I say, you know, don't look, don't look to bring it on five or six. Try one, you know, take one for a test drive, find that open position that you have, the rec you've got out there, and then meet the person. And again, we're not going to send you somebody and you're not going to meet them for the first time and they walk in your door. You're going to have interviewed them uh, during the entire process 
process. We have a full interview day where the fellows interview with all the companies. So you know who you're going to get. You rank order the fellows. So you may interview 30 fellows for that position. You're going to rank order them. And they fellows then rank order the companies. Uh, so just take a chance. Uh, and I promise you, I, I would say, it's, I know we're in Las Vegas. It's not gambling. Okay. <laughs> in this particular case, you're not really gambling on this because it's almost, you know, if, if, if uh, Las Vegas gave out the time rate of return gambling wise that we do in the fellowship program, Las Vegas will go under <laughs> because you're talking again about an 80% selection rate uh, for the folks that are going through there. And if you go all higher, cause we have about 10% of the population. once they go to the fellowship realize, Hey, I want to go back and get additional schooling mm-hmm. or I want to get more technical stuff. So you add that 10% in and then we're well over 90% of the overall success rate for those going through. So, you know, take a chance, contact us. Uh, we'd love to work for you. Las Vegas has a lot to offer for the service members. It's a great community. Community and, and we, we want to partner. Speaking of contacting, what is the best way for people to yeah, contact? Yeah, through Merity Leary. So I think we have it up on our website on there. You know, Merity's email is yep. mleary at uschamber.com. Yep. That's mleary at uschamber.com. And then our website, uh, hiringourheroes.org. Uh, you can go to that and learn about the fellowship program. Well, I can tell you Las Vegas Heels is committed to making sure that we help this program any way that we can. Uh, we enjoy the relationship that we've been building with Merity. We hope to bring her together with senior leadership of human resource departments from healthcare across the valley. Uh, I personally am committed to helping this out beyond healthcare and to other industries. Uh, we thank you for all that you're doing. We appreciate you taking time out of your schedule. You don't live here. You flew in. You're on the show. We, we're grateful for that. Well, no, I, well, I'm very thankful for you know giving the opportunity to come talk today and, uh, again, what Las Vegas is doing to support the overall veteran community. Very good. Well, thank you for joining the show, and thank you to our uh, followers today. And if you miss the show, you will be able to catch it up on our YouTube channel. It will be pushed out on our Inside Medicine channel, as well as Las Vegas Heels Headlines. So thank you for being here with us today, and we look forward to seeing you next Thursday.